Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is a special live episode of Dispatches. The killing fields in Gaza grow more horrific by the day. As Israel continues to intentionally massacre civilians, hunt journalists, intellectuals, and medical professionals, starve babies, and bomb hospitals. Israeli society, meanwhile, is consumed by genocidal celebratory hate. They cheer when bombs fall and take pleasure in images of mutilated and dismembered Palestinians in the Gaza death camp. And U.S. officials continue to justify these atrocities with proclamations of but Hamas. While most of the world is disgusted and shocked at the barbarity, Arabs in the region aren't surprised. Zionists have been stealing Palestine for more than 75 years. This is the Israel we've always known, a European settler colony founded on ethnic cleansing and genocidal hatred of Arabs. This is the Zionist project with its mask off, exposing its rot to the world without shame. So what are the historical roots of the genocide in Gaza? How did Zionism form? What has Palestinian resistance to the Zionist project looked like over the century? And how have its failures and successes influenced Palestinian and Lebanese resistance today? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Asad Abu Khalil, a Lebanese American professor of political science at California State University. Good morning. Asad, please. welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thank you so much for coming on again. I think this this context that you're gonna provide to our, our viewers and listeners is so, so important, uh, given the fact that everybody's a little bit, maybe, you know, people who haven't been following this issue aren't entirely aware of the history behind it. And to understand how we got here, you do have to understand the last hundred years. Before we get started, though, I do want to ask those who are watching to please make sure that you like the episode. Uh, it does help us in the algorithm. And also, if you haven't subscribed to the Breakthrough News YouTube channel, make sure you do that as well. Um, okay, so Asad, we have so much ground to cover here. Let's just jump right into it. Let's start at the beginning. Um, let's start with the original anti-Semitism. Uh, in particular, you know, how this kind of European anti-Semitism in its particular time period propelled this Zionist movement to create this Jewish homeland. Uh, and then we can we can go from there. But let's start at, at, at that place. Excellent, Rania. Excellent. I really think it's important uh, to shed light on the origin and evolution of the Arab-Israeli question. And there are so many myths about how to examine it. When I started teaching the subject more than exactly 35 years ago at Tufts University, I had to decide where to begin. Because some people begin with ancient time, with the Old Testament and so on. And even Jimmy Carter in his book uh, about uh, the sons of Abraham, he goes back, he said it's all happening in ancient years and so on. And people always say they've been killing each other for ancient. This is a way to obfuscate the origin. No, 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 no. This is not an ancient conflict. This is not a religious conflict. This is a conflict over land. This is a conflict of clashing nationalism, which means it is through and through a modern conflict. And when we say it's a modern conflict, it means the solution are very clear and specific regarding the claim by the original inhabitant to their homeland. That's all what it's about. And I find that it's always important for students to learn about the origin. And I was just saw, looking at a survey of young people in America, and we find that they are overwhelmingly now, there's an argument in the New York Times today, supportive of the Palestinian perspective. And we should compound, we, we should associate that with another survey which says young people are the one who follows the close, most closely the conflict today. So they are the one with the most knowledge. And it is not a coincidence that those who follow it closely are more likely to be sympathetic to the Palestinians. And we, all of us who teach on college campuses in the United States, we find when people learn about the conflict, and I am an old fashioned teacher, I don't propagandize in classes. And I find that when people get uh, you know, their hands on the facts of the conflict, their minds are changed by virtue of what happened. So the origin is anti-Semitism in Europe. There's no question about that. Jews have suffered for centuries from the Catholic Church and even from the liberal Westerners in their hostility to Jews. I mean, there were successive campaigns of hostility and pogroms against Jewish people. You know, they were kicked out of England 12th century, from France 13th century, just wholesale campaign of hatred against Jewish people. We in the Middle East, 
We never had anything like that. Maxime Rodinson, who is a very fair historian, says that in the looking at the history of the Arab Islamic civilization, we find that persecution was rare in its history. There was discrimination. There's no question about that. Just there were discrimination of non-Jews as well in the Muslim empire. There were discrimination against Shiites sometimes, against Jews and whatever. Uh, so it, we're not saying about equality for all, but as the historians Usama uh, Khalidi in his recent book talks about, uh, that they were living pretty much in coexistence. And the biggest evidence that they were living in relative calm and peace with their neighbors, and I mean, they were not even neighbors, they were part of the landscape and the fabric of society. That when they were facing expulsion, they sought refuge in the Ottoman Empire, in Turkey, or in North Africa, because they felt they were not encountering an ideology of hostility. Sure, there were people who were making references in religious texts that were unsympathetic to Jewish people and so on. Sometimes people make that about Druze, about Christians and so on. That existed, but there was nothing like the embrace by the Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church of blaming Jewish people for the death of Christ. That was quintessential West. And Theodor Herzl is the founder of Zionism. He grew up in the uh, in in Hungary, and then he became a, a correspondent for a newspaper in Vienna, and he was alarmed by what was what he was witnessing, and he was in Paris during the Dreyfus affair, and Dreyfus was a Jewish captain who was falsely accused of uh, treason, and his trial brought about the ugliest, most repugnant forms of hatred against Jewish people. People were walking down the streets in France and chanting "Death to the Jews," and Herzl was witness to that. So he became alarmed, just as others were. And there was a guy behind, uh, before him, Leo Pinsker, who in 1882 wrote a book, Auto Emancipation, in which he talked about we need to find a solution, to find a state for the Jews. And that was what the search was about, uh, Rania. So because of anti-Semitism, they were not looking for Palestine. They were looking for a haven for Jewish people. And this is why it was a state of the Jews and not a Jewish state. Uh, for example, for Leo Pinsker, who came before Herzl, he said, it doesn't matter where. It's a matter of pragmatism where the location is. He just wanted to find a humanitarian solution because they lost faith in the ability of the West to deliver equality to Jewish people. Herzl, along the same line, he witnesses anti-Semitism, and he wrote his book, uh, Der Judenstaat. Look at the uh, tricks of the Zionist movement. His book in German can be translated as The State of the Jews. If you look up the book in the libraries today, it is translated as the Jewish state. But Herzl was a secular man. He didn't want a state that was Jewish in culture and character. He wanted a secular westernized state. And he, in his book, did not decide on the location. He was open-minded. In fact, the chapter on the location, he said, Argentina or Palestine. And they discussed different places, Uganda and so on. And the reason why they were talking about all these places is that Zionism came out of Europe. And Europe is a racist colonial context. And Herzl and the Zionist movement were racist. They were speaking about the native like they were something that we can push away. As Herzl himself, the founder of Zionism, the other day I was looking at a press conference or a meeting with uh, Netanyahu. And you look behind him, always you will find a picture of a bearded man. That's Theodor mm -hmm. Herzl, the founder of Zionism. And Herzl was a racist, was a colonialist. And in his book, Der Judenstaat of 1896, uh, he basically describes the outline of a westernized state, and he wasn't sure where it is. Within a year, when he was gathering around Jews to come to his founding Zionist conference in Basel, Switzerland, and it convened in 1897, uh, he had to settle on Palestine. Why? Because the religious Jews of Eastern Europe told him, we are not going to attend your conference unless you settle it and finalize it that it has to be Palestine, because 2,000 years ago we had a kingdom and we have to go back, and that would galvanize the community. It was only then that he agreed on the location. And in the first founding document of Zionism, Rania, they speak about colonizing, colonizing Palestine. Colonizing was not a dirty word. It was a word that they used with pride, because the context of Zionism was one that is hospitable to racist colonial ideas. And the movement, and you see that in Herzl himself, they were appealing to the racist impulses. And more than that, they were appealing to the anti-Semitic impulses of the Western audience. They were saying it, you know, you don't like Jews to be here. Well, let us go there. And of course, 
the Westerners, racist, anti-Semitic bigots like uh, Lord Balfour, who gave the famous declaration, they were sympathetic because of that. We'll get rid of our Jews and we'll put them somewhere else. Now, did they know there was another population? Of course they did. You may say, what about that slogan by a famous Zionist, a, people, uh, a land without a people for a people without a land, which was not said by Herzl, contrary to what we read often. Uh, and that slogan tell you, it is not that they didn't know there was a people. They meant the people did not amount to human beings. Yeah. Look at the rhetoric of the Israelis today. They know there are human beings, but they were not their equal. It is exactly like the founding ideology of white supremacy in the United States. They knew they were Native American. They knew they were African American. They brought against their will, but they did not amount to their equal. And for that, they were justified in their mind in subjugating, enslaving them. Same thing for, for the Palestinians. Theodore Herzl said blatantly, he quoted the French proverb, qui veut la fin veut le, mien, le moyen. He who desires the end desires the mean. By that he meant, we will kick them out. He said, we need to spirit them away. We need to spirit them away. Because he said, they are not going to amount to much of a resistance. And for that, we'll get rid of them. But he said, look how sensitive he was. We'll do that quietly. And two years before his death, in, a, in 1902, he wrote his book, Alt Neuland, in German, in which he describes the Jewish state in 25 years. And in it, there are Arabs, and there's a character of Rashid Beg. And that guy was singing the praises of Zionism because he said uh, the Jewish state brought up prosperity as if that's all what they care about. That's all we've got. The Palestinians began their resistance, became aware of the danger of Zionism very early on. There's a man by the name of Yusuf Zia al-Khalidi who wrote in the 1891 a letter to the rabbi of France telling them this project is going to hurt us. And that letter was transmitted to Dior Herzl. He wrote back. The notion that the Palestinians were not aware, they were aware from very early on. And in fact, some of the early alarm bells were rang by the, Christ the Christian intelligentsia of Palestine. People like Najib Nassar, who edited the journal, the Carmel. They were the, the, on the forefront of anti-Zionism. And in fact, look how the Zionist movement changes. Back then, they thought our enemies are the Christian Palestinians. The Muslim were not going to be a problem. Just like today, they say, our really? problem is Muslim fanaticism, not the Christians, you see? But the Christians raised the alarm, but the Palestinians were also equally alarmed about what was happening. So by 1917, this so uh, Lord Rothschild started uh, financing uh, the flight of Jews into the Holy Land. And they came to the Holy Land, and uh, basically the land was already prosperous. I mean, took at Gaza in the early 20th century, they added 800,000 dunums of olive trees in Gaza. P people were trying to cultivate whatever land they could. They were very serious about bringing prosperity to their homeland long before the Jewish immigration. And the majority were Palestinian Christians and Muslims and Jews were in the minority. 24,000 in 1850s versus 600,000 for the Palestinians, but they all lived together. There were no cases of clashes before the advent of Zionism. So the Zionism came to the picture and they started mistreating the population, mistreating the population. So you have one of the founders of cultural Zionism, Ahad Ha'am. He wrote a letter called A Letter from the Holy Land in which he scolded his fellow Zionists. He said, look how we are treating these natives. Look how we abuse them. We think of them as animals and we mistreat them. He said, we think of them as stupid, but they know what we're doing and they're going to come out and rebel against us. And that's what happened. 1917 is another watershed, uh, Rania, when uh, Lord Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, issued his famous declaration, in which, to summarize it, he promised a national home for the Jewish people. A national home for the Jewish people. 1917. For the Palestinians, he didn't, mention, he didn't name them. He called them the non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Imagine, he is referring to the majority of population, not by what they were, but, but where they were not. Because the term of reference was the Jewish population. It is like describing the American population as non-Arab. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It would be so absurd. Why don't you call them Arab? Because they did not amount to peoplehood in the eyes of the racist, colonialist British. So the Balfour Declaration made a simple formula. It promised national home for the Jewish people. And for the non-Jewish community, it said, we'll give you religious and civil rights, but not political rights. The Balfour Declaration, we think about it when you study its history, as if it was formulated by the British. No, not true at all. It was by the Zionists. The Zionist movement began to formulate their plan, 
and they lobbied the British government and later the American government to adopt them. Just like whatever comes out of US Congress today from Bernie Sanders or from Mitch McConnell, all of these people, whatever they mouth off, it's not their mind speaking. They speak on behalf of the Zionist lobby. And this is why it is fitting for APAC to be tweeting and retweeting Bernie Sanders, because he has been a slave to the APAC like anybody else in Congress, all other members as well. This is why there is no dissent. So we can't say it was Bernie Sanders who decided I don't want a ceasefire. No, the APAC did not want a ceasefire. And all these tools of APAC in Congress were saying the same thing. When if APAC were to change his mind, Bernie Sanders will change his mind. That's how it works. So the Zionist movement were behind the, the Balfour Declaration. And of course, it was untenable, Rania, because we're talking about 91% of the population the Palestinians were referred to as non-Jewish communities. Something is odd about that formulation. And the second thing is the Jews owned two or three percent of the land and they were promised a home, a, a national home for the Jewish people. I mean, what do you do with the population? Of course, you enslave them, you subjugate them, and then you expel them out of the land if you want to have Jewish state against their will, against the will of the native who have been attached to the land, living there for hundreds of years. And even historians like Zionist historian like Yosef Barat speaks about there was always people tell you, but they did not have a Palestinian state before that. Nobody had a state before the Ottoman during the Ottoman Empire. We were not allowed to. There was no Lebanese state. There was no uh, Syrian state. There was no Iraqi state because they were not allowed. They were living not in misery, by the way. They were living rather decently under the Ottoman Empire as communities protected by the Ottoman Empire, and the communities got along rather certainly much better. Then they did in 20th century Germany or Austria, another place, or Poland. Yeah. Uh, certainly much better than that. Imagine centuries ago. So uh, after the Balfour Declaration, it became very clear to the Palestinians what was happening before their eyes. And that's what the clashes started. And then the British mandate took over Palestine against the wishes of the population who wanted independence. And the British mandate started to implement the term of the Zionist promise to establish a national home. Notice they said a national home. They did not say state. Why? Because that has been the history of the Zionist movement. They were not honest. They always resorted to deception, to trickery, and outright lies. So whenever we see the lies by the Israeli army today, we know there's a long background to these lies and fabrication. So they said national home because they did not want to tell the population, we're going to establish a state over your heads. Yeah. Later in 1942, the Zionist movement met in Biltmore, New York, when the center of gravity of the Zionist movement moved from Europe into the United States by order of David Ben-Gurion, they changed their wordage. They said a Jewish commonwealth. They did not want to use the word state because they know the majority would not go for it. So with the Balfour Declaration, that's where Wait, violence started. Assad, I, I want to ask you real quick. Um... I'm not asking. I want to. I just want to make a point, just for those who are unfamiliar. When we talk about the British mandate after World War One, the British and French, and after the fall of the, of the Ottoman Empire, the British and French basically did what the, it's like the Berlin Conference in Africa, where they split it up by which imperial power gets Correct. it, and the British and France split the Middle East. Uh, France, France gets you know Lebanon. Was it Syria? Um, British get Jordan, Palestine, um, Iraq as well, I believe. Um, Correct. So. The, this is just like imperial hubris. You just get to take what you want. So that's what just, I just want to give some clarity to what you're referring to when we talk about the British mayor in minute, but please You're continue. absolutely right. And we can also add that the British lied to the Arabs. I mean, the whole story of, I don't want to mention his name because it is such an insult to the native to speak about Lawrence of Arabia. Here's just one white yeah. man. He goes to the area and he will make him like such a big figure and we make movies and plays about him. I don't care to speak about that man, but I'll speak, I'll speak about the history of the conflict. Uh, in before the end of the Second World War, the British government entered into negotiation with the Sharif of Mecca, the Hashemites who were in Jeddah at the time, in uh, Hejaz. And they promised that they will give a special independence for the Palestinians, that they were not going to take away Palestine, and they promised it to be a separate, separate entity. And of course, in secret, without telling the Arabs, they were already collaborating with the French in dividing the area, like you suggested. So France would take over Syria and Lebanon, Britain would take Iraq and Palestine, and Jerusalem was supposed to be an international city. And we didn't know about these agreements, Rania, until the Bolshevik uh, Revolution. Only the Bolshevik Revolution, they oh. uncovered from the archives the text of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which told us that they were lying to us. And that's when we got really angry. And that's where the Palestinians started forming their uh, resistance movement, and especially the peasant. Now, 
we find that we were at a disadvantage, the Palestinians compared to the Zionists. The Zionists were heavily armed, were heavily financed, and uh, they also had the sponsor of the British government, which allowed them to have their own gendarme, gendarme, uh, gendarmerie uh, police force and did not allow that to the Palestinians. The, the Zionists were allowed to have their own representative body. The Palestinians were offered but didn't want to participate in a mandate that had in its preamble the Balfour Declaration, which is basically a negation of the national existence of the Palestinian people. How could they cooperate with them? Because you hear from people like Abba Iban, the foreign minister of Israel, the Palestinian never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. No, every opportunity the Palestinians missed had to be missed, had to be rejected all the way to the Camp David Agreement, which did not even give the Palestinian 20% of historic Palestine, didn't even give them West Bank and Gaza, and did not give them the right of return, did not give them Jerusalem. They want to create a suburb outside of Jerusalem and tell them, here, we will call that piece of land, Abu Dis, we'll call it Jerusalem. I mean, they were playing games and lying to the Palestinians like they always done. And for that reason, Yasser Arafat, as much as he was a sellout, uh, he did not go for that. Rashid Khalidi, in his book, 100 Year, uh, uh, went into great effect to refute that. And Brzezinski, the National Security Advisor, also in his last years, refuted the notion that Bill Clinton offered the Palestinians a great deal and it was rejected. Uh, that wasn't the case at all. And of course, Bill Clinton is the last person we can believe about anything, personal or political. Yeah. Now, uh, the Palestinians started, there were clashes and there were dead people, uh, civilians were being killed on both sides. But of course, always, most of the time, what year, there were what more year are, we in, uh, are we in like 1930s? We're speaking about 21, 22, all the way to 1929. 29. I mean, the Zionists became more assertive. They became more arrogant. They started displaying their power. They basically made it all clear that they are going to take away the Palestinian homeland. The Palestinians were reacting often violently. And sometimes, like in 1929, innocent Jews who were not even Zionists were uh, killed in Hebron, for example. I mean, I concede these facts of the conflict, but there was none of that before Zionism. It was all about Zionism, came from Europe, and they poisoned the relationship between the native Jews and the native Palestinians. In fact, the native Jews were Palestinians. You see, it was only separated in the minds of the native when these Europeans came with arrogance and with firepower to take over the land. Now, in 1936, 1939, the Palestinians revolted in a major revolt. They wanted to basically smash Zionist forces, but they couldn't. And the reason why I revolted in 1936, and there's a very good study about that revolt by Hassan Kanifani, the famous martyr of Palestine, and it is translated into English now, so you can find it for free online. Uh, why did they revolt in 1935? For several reasons. One, because first of all, the, the Jews did not buy all of Palestine. This is a myth. They bought less than 7-8%. By 1948, they bought 8% of Palestine. And 90% of what they bought were from absentee landlord. There were wealthy Lebanese who were absentee landlord, like the Sursuk family. This The family did a major betrayal. They sold so much of the land because they didn't care. They had no attachment. And they were collaborators with the Israelis. They sold a lot of land. But most of the land was not sold. The Most of the land was Palestinian. So the Palestinians were alarmed at the Zionists came and they would buy the land and then they would kick the peasants out. Because in the past, when ownership of the land changed hands, the Palestinian peasant did not feel the difference. They were still living on the land, tilling the land. But the Zionists came and said, get out of our land. So they were unemployed. These were the fertile ground for revolutionary military organization. And in the cities where there was an influx of Jewish capital from Europe, they couldn't find jobs either. They were unemployed. Why? Because the Zionists employed the principle of Hebrew labor. There's a good PhD on that by uh, Steve Glazer at Georgetown University in history department in the 1980s. Hebrew labor basically was, I mean, look how exclusive and bigoted it is. We want to exclude non-Jews from our Jewish enterprises. So the Palestinians were unemployed. They couldn't find city uh, work in the countryside or in the cities. Two, in 1935, uh, there were workers in Jaffa port unloading from a ship, and they found a huge shipment of arms, 1930s coming to the Zionist organization. They were already, by the 1920s, they were already forming their military, uh, paramilitary organization. The Palestinians were, until 1948, poorly equipped, poorly trained. They were still using mascots and rifles from a previous century. And nobody was helping them. There was no Iran back then, Rania. So they were entirely on their own. And Arab armies, then and now, were not in the business 
of arming these Palestinians because they did not want to upset their benefactors in the West who ran these governments. So uh, the other reason is the percentage of Jewish immigration was increasing. 10,000, 20,000 per year, 30,000 in 1935. And of course, the Jews were coming in large numbers. Why? Because of Nazi Germany. They were fleeing for their lives. And of course, they deserved a haven for them. But why should that haven be created atop an existing Palestinian nation? This was a European problem. This was European disgusting hatred. And it should have been resolved by Europe. Instead, the racist European thought that the Palestinian homeland is dispensable and the Palestinian people could be shunted around. To this very day, they tell you, why don't they go to Arab countries? Why don't they go to Jordan, to Syria? They don't want to go. They are Palestinians. Yes, we are all Arabs, but we also have attachment to our own small entity, Lebanese or Syrian, whatever it is. And that's the same for the Palestinians. So uh, the other reason for the revolt of, uh, of the Palestinians is that they were fed up with British biases. The first high commissioner of Britain in Palestine was an ardent Zionist, Herbert Samuel, who did everything in his power to further the Zionist movement. Even though local British official, once they set foot on Palestine, they became sympathetic to the population because they saw what was happening. The natives were losing their homeland before their eyes with British support. So they revolted by virtue of arms, but most of the people killed was, as usual, Arabs. And also the British were very biased in that they disarmed the Arab population. They allowed the Jews to have their own arms. And by 1937, so start 1936, 1937, the first phase of the Intifada, it was an Intifada. It was an Intifada for their own right. So the Arab government, kings and princes of the time, who were all clients of the British, from Saudi Arabia to Jordan to Lebanon to Egypt, all of them came and said, uh, calm down, we'll resolve it for you. We'll talk to the British and everything's going to be fine. So they put down their arm and then nothing happened. Instead, the British came with the Peel Commission report, which suggested the partition of Palestine. That's the first time the idea came into, into use. 1937, imagine. So they told the Palestinians, we'll divide the land. We'll give you 80% and we'll give the Jews 20%. And we can have two states. The Palestinians, of course, rejected it as they should have. Because nobody, imagine if they tell America, you know what, give us uh, Oklahoma and Kansas and have the rest of the country. Yeah, 20%. We'll have it for a move, for a special homeland for Arab Americans. I mean, can you imagine the reaction? <laughs> of course, it will be rejected. Yeah, right. And we'll bring more Arabs from the Arab world into this. Oh new my gosh, homeland. it sounds like a Fox News nightmare. I know, I know. And Bernie Sanders' nightmare. Bernie Sanders' nightmare. Yeah, as well. I know. Bernie Sanders. Nightmare. We, we should keep that man always in the camp of Fox News and APAC. So oh, the Palestinians rejected it. Because why did they reject it, by the way? Because it sound 80%. Why would they not have it? They gave the most fertile land of the Galilee to the Jewish side. Plus, what about the Jewish section, 20%, which had a small Arab population? How much is the Arab population in the Jewish sector of that two state? It was 300,000. They said, we will kick them out. We will kick them out. So the Palestinians were up in arms. They went back and they revolted. And 1939, it ended in failure. And the Palestinians got embroiled in internecine internis in fights between each other in fighting. And there were families, Nashashibis versus the Husseinis. And there were a lot of collaborators. Let's and forget, it, it, let's not forget this is the era of feudalism in a lot of the regions. So, absolutely. like, a lot, a lot of class aspect here is it, it, it just want to throw that in there when you're talking about peasants and like the landlords. Absolutely, absolutely. And there was also a professional Palestinian class, lawyers, and so on, who wanted moderation, who wanted to speak to the Zionists and negotiate with them. And they tried, but That's there was right. no compromise forthcoming on that side. They wanted the land, all of the land, and they did not want to share it. And they were very clear. Now we know in their deliberation what they meant. And Theodore Herzl spoke about, we want to create an area of civilization for Europe as opposed to these, an area of barbarism. That's where we were, barbarian. To this very day, the rhetoric of the Zionists has not changed. It, we are barbarian and subhuman, and that's how they speak about us. So it ended in failure in 1939, but the British were alarmed about what was happening. So they sent, uh, they, and, and of course, the numbers of the Palestinians did not mean to the British. Even Balfour said, when we decided on the Balfour Declaration, a numerical self-determination was excluded, just like apartheid South Africa. It's not in the numbers, Rania. It's in the quality of the population, the quality <laughs> of your genes. So the Jewish immigrants were of a superior stock. The Palestinians were inferior stock. And that's why we can trample on the right and give them no political rights, whatever. 
We give them civil and religious, collect your garbage, just like Palestinian Authority today, the collaborative authority of the Palestinians. So in 1939, the, the British government came with a new plan called the White Paper of McDonald White Paper. What did they promise? They said, this time we'll split it into two. No, no, no. In 1939, the White Paper, they said, we will limit Jewish immigration to 75,000 for five years. And after that, it will be subject to the constant of the population of, popula population of Palestine. Uh, second, we will have a state established in 10 years, a Palestinian state in 10 years. But it wasn't clear. And they did not say, basically, we're going to abrogate the Balfour Declaration. So the Palestinians did not like it. And the Zionists did not like it. And both of them were mad at the British. And that's when the Zionists took up arms against the British. And they were very heavily armed. And especially because during the Second World War, they were allowed to have the Jewish army to fight alongside the British. And Jabotinsky, the founder of revisionist Zionism. Revisionist Zionism, Rania, is the origins of the Likud party today and all the far right in Israel today. Vladimir Jabotinsky is, uh, who is close associate with the father of Netanyahu. Jabotinsky was, in the eyes of Albert Einstein and Hannah Arendt, a fascist. A fascist. For him, the movement is about the racial recipe of a nation. I mean, when somebody defies nationhood by racial recipe, you know what he's talking about. He yeah. said a nation defines itself by parades, by ceremony, by discipline. I mean, he took ideas of fascism and uh, applied them to the Zionist movement. Right. So uh, the, Briti the British allowed them to become more armed, and they started their terrorism. By 1930s, the Zionists employed all the terrorist methods that we now complain about today, all of them. Throwing grenades in buses, uh, booby-trapped cars, uh, car bombs, uh, uh, you know, car bombs at hotel, King David 1946, killing Jews, Arabs, and British. Uh, throwing uh, bombs in crowded markets, letter bombs, uh, bombs at barrel embassies bombs. in Europe. I mean, all of these terror... Barrel these bombs. Barrel bombs, absolutely. They were employed in Jaffa in order to clear it up to establish Tel Aviv, the greater Tel Aviv. All these terrorist uh, weapons were used and introduced, pioneered by really the Zionists. So by that time, uh, the Arabs knew that they had nowhere to go, that the Zionists going to take over their homeland. So they relied on Arab governments. Arab governments were clients of the British, and they gave them false promises. If you read the memoirs of Musa al-Alami, one of the leaders of the Palestinians, he spoke about how he goes to Arab capitals to ask for their help because they knew the war is coming and it's not going to be in their favor. So the president of Syria took him aside and said, do not worry, do not look for arms, all will be well. He said, why? We are desperate, we need arms. He said, no, you don't understand. We have an atomic bomb in Syria. He was, the guy was shocked. He said, what do you mean you have atomic bomb? He said, yes, we have a skillful tinsmith in Damascus who came, invented the atomic bomb. So, I mean, he realized that they had nothing to rely on. The Iraqi lead government told them uh, that we're going to be forthcoming with military support and so on. And uh, the Zionists, after the Second World War, were increasing immigration, legal and illegal immigration. The British did not turn away. And the American government, filled with anti-Semites like Theodore Herzl and many others, wanted to support. They wanted unlimited immigration in Palestine, but they were limiting Jewish immigration into America. Even at the heart of the Holocaust, FDR did not allow more than three, 4,000 to come into the United States. European government wanted to solve the Jewish problem. It is a problem to them. It shouldn't be a problem. The Jewish problem was not exist in, among Arabs and Muslims. There was absolutely no qualm. My mother told me, she, I mean, she grew up in 1929. There were no poison in the relation between Arabs and Jews in the Arab world. The Jews were prosperous in some areas. They were not always prosperous. They were much like Arabs. Sometimes they were poor, sometimes they were rich, because some anti-Semites think that Jews uh, have a monopoly of finance and richness. I saw a segment with Bassem Youssef with Pierce Morgan, and um, Basim Yusuf was pretending to be sensitive to the Jewish question. And he went about to explain anti-Semitism and I was horrified. He was well, so really? anti-Semitic in what he spoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was saying yeah. that the Jews controlled finance and that's why. I mean, the Jews did not control finance. The Jews were poor in the pale of settlement. They were often uh, penniless. And as Leo Prinsker said, if the Jews are wealthy, they are blamed for controlling finance. If they were poor, they were called beggars. If they were patriotic, they were called fascists. I mean, they were blamed no matter what they did. So in the Arab world, the plight of the Jews varied from one place to another. In Yemen, they were very poor. In Baghdad, in Beirut, so like, they were very Also, prosperous. let's remember, much in the same way as the rest of the population. 
you're not they were denied. part of the population. No, I'm just saying, like, you're, it's when we talk about that, it's like, well, yeah, a lot of Yemenis were poor. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I remember. So and my mother tells me when she was growing up in 1920s, my grandfather's house in the mountain resort of Saufar, for example, was purchased Which I've seen. from the... Exactly. From the chief, from the chief uh, of the Jewish community in Lebanon. He sold the house to my grandfather. They were on good terms. They were friendly. And on the Sabbath, my mother would tell me Jewish families would call on them to help them turn on the lights on, on Saturdays and so on. There were no, no poison relationship. It is Zionism that poisoned it, either by impact and by associating Jews of the Arab world with Zionism, which was a totally repugnant ideology for the Arabs, because it was a racist and is a racist ideology. And second, because the Zionist movement actively sabotaged the existence of Jews in the Arab countries. Look at the new book by Avi Schlein, in which he talked about the secret intelligence plan by Israel in order to cause the flight of Jews from Iraq into the Holy Land. And they were engaged in bombs. They did the same in Egypt. They recruited local Jews in order to put bombs at British and American interests to poison the relationship between Nasser and the West. So they were resorting. They did not care about local Jews. And if Jews were allowed to exist, they would say, look at them. They are locked behind closed doors. They cannot leave. And when they allow them to leave, they say, oh, they kicked them out. <laughs> they played yeah, propaganda I games with the plight of Jews in the Arab world. Was the Jewish plight ideal after 1948? Of course not. It was by virtue of what Israel and Zionism did. But many Jews became attached to the land. It's like one uh, Jewish Lebanese I knew up until 1982. He told me, I don't want to leave the land. This is my country. I'm Lebanese. I am Arab. And then after 1982, the Israeli army came. They had the address of every Jewish person in Beirut. And they told him, come, come with us to occupy Palestine. And that guy told me, he refused to go. He said, I told him, I don't belong to Israel. I'm an Arab. I am here with my brother and sister. And the Palestinians were friends of mine. So 1948 came. First, 1947, the United Nations partitioned Palestine. It was a not binding resolution because it was by the General Assembly. November of 1947, they said, we are going to divide Palestine. And how do you divide Palestine? We give 50% of the land to the Jews who were uh, one third of the population, and we give them the best land of Palestine. And we give the Palestinians something like 42% of the land, and Jerusalem would be a international uh, protection. And of course, the Palestinians were horrified and rightfully, and to their pride, they rejected it. They are not going to give up their land for any reason, not even for 42% of what they consider to be their entire homeland, which we call historic Palestine. That slogan, from the river to the sea, what does it mean? It merely is a reference of the place from which Palestinians came, from which they hailed and they lived for centuries. And that place housed Christian Palestinians, Muslim Palestinians, and Jewish Palestinians. But the Zionist immigrant who came from Europe were coming from somewhere else, had no attachment to the land, and they want to displace the existing population. But in order to create a Jewish state, they had to kick out the population, either kill them all or kick them all out. And that's what they did. They kicked out 750,000, and they allowed a small minority to stay so that they can say, look at us, we are a democracy. We allow these small amount of Palestinians to stay. Of course, they were not under equal protection of the law. From 1946 until, from 1948, until 1968, sorry, 1966, they were put under military rule. Military rule. If you go from one village to another, you have the permission from the police. They were subjected to mistreatment throughout consistently, even after 1966. So uh, there was a war, and uh, the Palestinians, uh, people say, there was an invasion of Arab armies. Seven Arab armies came, Arab armies came to have the Palestinians, but they were, they were ragtag Arab armies. They were shooting at each other. They were not organized. The government were loyal to the British, and they were not helping the Palestinians. And the Palestinians were poorly organized and poorly equipped. As a result, there was no question about it. As one British official said, in 1948, the Zionists could have won against all of the Arab world, just like in 1967, they could win against so many Arab armies. Even until today, American foreign policy states that they will support Israel to win against not one Arab state, not two Arab states, any combination of Arab states. That's the extent of America's commitment to Israel. So the state of Israel was created. And then it said that the Palestinians who we kicked out will not be allowed to return. 
And instead, in 1952, they promulgated the law of return, which said any Jewish person from Modesto, from New York, from anywhere in the world can come and become an automatic citizen. But if a Palestinian who was kicked out from his home were to come and try to check on his home, they were shot like pigeons at the border. It is estimated that thousands of Palestinians were shot at and killed because they would come to check their land and their home to see what happened to them. And the state of Israel was created. 500 America, villages, over 500 villages. They destroyed over 500 villages, meticulously well-planned with a bunch of terrorist gangs. That absolutely. Like and if, and I refer to the, the viewers to uh, read the book, All That Remains, uh, by Walid Khalidi and the team of researchers, I was included among them as a graduate student uh, to, to document all these villages, what happened to them. It is so sad, Rani, you would feel, for example, this village had a church. The church today is a bar serving Israel. Uh, this village had a mosque and the, bar, the mosque now is like an entertainment center or you know something like that. They changed the landscape. They wanted to erase uh, the marks of their crime, but it won't be erased. It is registered. We keep tabs. It is all registered in notebooks, all their crimes from early on. The only difference of what's happening today in Gaza is that we are seeing the war crimes and the genocide live. Back then, there were no cameras. They were only still pictured. And even the picture of the Nakba were not readily available because Arab government did not want to publicize it because they were afraid rightly how it's going to come back and haunt them and the Arab anger is going to topple these governments. And that's what happened within a few years. And this is why I expect there will be a reverberation, a reverberation to what was happening, what is happening today after 20,000 uh, killed. So the Palestinians uh, after 1948, Rania, they thought Arab governments will help us out and we just wait to return back to our home. And they were living in refugee camps throughout the Middle East, including in Gaza, including in the West Bank, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan. And they were waiting for their return. And in 1967, Arab governments were defeated uh, humiliatingly in a few hours. And that told the Palestinians, you have to rely on, them, on yourself. And that's when Palestinian armed resistance grew. It only took 65. The Palestinians waited. People said, why did they not try nonviolent struggle? First of all, who are you to decide for the Palestinians what forms of struggle to try? I will not try for the Palestinians. I will not tell them. I will not decide for them what methods of struggle to decide. It is they who decided. And the last thing I want is Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International or Western Liberals telling the Palestinians, you can throw rock, but you cannot fire a gun. Or you can. You are talking about people fighting against a genocidal army with nuclear weapons who is willing to poison the wells of water for Arabs with the order of Ben-Gurion in 1948? No, they have every right to resist. The right to self-defense is entitled by the Palestinians and not by the occupiers. That's one of the misnomers about the, uh, the, the debate today. So they took up arms and they formed an armed resistance group. Unfortunately, there were many groups. Unfortunately, they were not very effective. And unfortunately, their leader was a miserable, lousy leader by the name of Yasser Arafat, who, as Brzezinski once said about him, he was never serious about resist military resistance, and he was never serious about diplomacy. He failed in both. And he waited until Gulf government cut off funding to him in 1991 because of the invasion of Kuwait, that he felt in a moment of weakness that I'm going to reach a secret deal with the Israelis. And the worst thing you can do as a liberation movement, you don't negotiate when you're weak. You negotiate when you're strong. Look at the Vietnamese, but who am I? Am I comparing the miserable Yasser Arafat, the pawn of Saudi Arabia, to the heroic resistance of the Viet Cong, the heroic resistance of the youths of Yemen, the heroic resistance of Lebanese against Israel, the heroic resistance of the Algerian? Yasser Arafat is the counter-revolutionary force in the Arab world. And if the Palestinians do not come to grips with that side and stop glamorizing him, and romanticizing them, we will continue to have the perpetuation of the corrupt collaborative rule of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, today, after all these years of defeat and humiliation, and by 1982, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was kicked out of Lebanon. Why? Because they lost the support of the population. They lost the support of the population in Jordan in 1970 as well. If they didn't, they would have been able to prevail. But by 1982, people were fed up by the thuggery of the disorganized Palestinian organization and Lebanese organization, we want to make it all Palestinians, that basically they did not mind the Israelis to, to come. However, tribute to Israel that its racism and butchery is such 
it can alienate a population even when sympathetic to it within a year. In 1982, I remember in the summer, I was at my aunt's house in Tyre, and the population was sympathetic at the time, unfortunately, regrettably, uh, because they thought Israel is going to make things better for them. And I told them within a year, when you go to pick up your oranges, you will realize what kind of brutal, savage enemy you're dealing with. And within a year, they started to rebel against the Israelis, and they shot the collaborators. All those who were collaborating openly with Israel were found shot dead. Nobody talks about that, by the way. In every I village, Rania, in I every village, you will find one or two. People don't talk about it. And whenever I mention it, I have people, relatives, and uh, people telling me, please don't talk about that chapter. No, I want to talk about that chapter. <laughs> I want to talk about that chapter because the Algerians got rid of their collaborators. The French got rid of their collaborators brutally. And every resistance movement have to get rid of their collaboration. Why do you think the Israelis cannot come to Gaza? Because Yahya Sinwa, the leader of Hamas, has been absolutely effective in rooting out collaborators in Gaza. He himself was chasing them down. And for that reason, they have no intelligence. One day they tell you the command center is under the hospital. One day they tell you we found it under occupator. One, yeah. one time they said we, we found the command center behind an MRI machine. I mean, it's just crazy. <laughs> stupid. The grenades. And... The good Assad grenades <laughs> by an MRI machine. Can you imagine what might happen to those grenades when you turn on uh, the MRI machine? <laughs> I know, I know, I, I don't know. But but isn't it amazing? I never thought we'd sit here and we'd be laughing at the quality and the stupidity of Israeli propaganda. And we find the military propaganda of Hamas and Hezbollah are really extremely impressive. I mean, I mean it's wow, incredible. wow. It's capturing the imagination of Arabs everywhere. I can tell you, Rania, right now, the unintended consequences. Joe Biden, this brilliant man, thought that we are going to separate Hamas from the Palestinian people. And he keeps telling them, Hamas does not represent the Palestinians. No, Joe Biden <laughs> represents the Palestinians. And now I can tell you, Hamas has never been more popular. I can tell you right now, in the Arab world, there's a cult worship for Abu Ubaidah, the military spokesperson of Hamas. And that's what we are now. I hope this background was helpful to the viewers. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you about... Um... I mean, okay, so we reached to eight, uh, we reached to 1982 Beirut, but I know you wanted right. to talk a bit about Egypt as well. Okay. Um, you wanted to touch on 1956, the Suez Crisis, Jamal Abdel Nasser, and then right. later mean, on, Anwar Sadat. What's the importance of right. the Egypt angle here? Uh, Egypt is very important, and that's something, uh, part of the legacy of Henry Kissinger, the ill-named, ill-cited Henry Kissinger. Mm -hmm. um, you see, as somebody in my age, 63, um, all the propaganda of Israel today, I'm familiar with it. You know, they say now, it's not about the Palestinians. The problem is uh, the, the Palestinian, uh, uh, the, the Iran. It's all about Iran. I mean, in the past, they said, the problem is not the Palestinian uh, people. It's the leader are bad. And now they say the Palestinian people are bad. I mean, they never settled. Sometimes they say it's Nasser. If it wasn't for Nasser, the Palestinians would be pleasurably enjoying uh, the Israeli occupation, if it wasn't for Iran, if it wasn't for Arafat, if it wasn't for Cuba, I mean, they always have a way in order to avoid the reality of which is your racist, subjugationist, genocidal occupation is the problem. The Palest and, and look at the tribute to the Palestinian people. After a century, we are still speaking about their heroic resistance against an army that is sponsored and supported by the entire Western world. And the Palestinians today have no one else. They only have Iran on their side to arm them and finance the resistance. Uh, in my time, Rania, but also look at the effective movements of today of Hezbollah and Hamas and look at the Houthis. I mean, these heroic Houthis whose story one day is going to be told like we speak about the Viet Cong and Ho Chi Minh. They have been incredible mm -hmm. how they defied the world. These are people living under siege. They are people of more than 70% relying on food aid for their survival. And yet they are willing to sacrifice to help the Palestinians. So in my days, the PLO and the Lebanese left had support from Soviet Union, Germany, East Germany, uh, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Algeria, Iraq, uh, Libya, Cuba, uh, Poland. I mean, all these countries were helping out the Palestinians and give us arms or money and so on. And China, of course, and Vietnam helped us. And we didn't do a good job. We just did not do a good job. I am afraid the model of resistance that was formed was not very effective. And as a result, Israel was able to move within hours from one area of Lebanon to another to reach the outskirts of Beirut within hours. Look what's happening today. I mean, this is unprecedented. People talk about Gaza like Stalingrad. Stalingrad is not like Gaza. Stalingrad, there was a river in which there were people sending aids and troops and so on. 
it wasn't entirely shut closed. Gaza is shut closed. And as a result, yet on their own, they were able to be steadfast and to resist over two months period with the entire bombardment nonstop on their heads, not distinguishing between civilians and Lebanese. So Egypt was a major part of the Arab uh, front in order to find a solution to the Palestinian problem. Nasser was the problem. Of course, he was compared to Hitler. Yasser Arafat was compared to Hitler. Hamas was compared. I mean, everybody is Hitler. And when you compare casual people to Hitler, you are insulting the victims of the Holocaust. No, yeah. I am the one who will say there is uniqueness to the Holocaust. There is uniqueness to Hitler. Do not invoke that analogy so casually. I used to tell Arabs, do not invoke that analogy casually, out of respect for the victims of the Holocaust. Now the Israelis do it for their own end, and it's not anti-Semite. So they focused on Nasser. They exhausted Nasser. They created a front with Nasser to bring down Nasser, and they failed. Nasser became a hero, and he was leading a revolution that inspired people around the world. You know, there are houses in Africa and Latin America where they still display portraits of Nasser. And they brought him down. I believe, I believe uh, that uh, Nasser was killed by the Americans. I don't know how or, or so, but I do believe that. And one time I asked a high-ranking U.S. official, retired, about that. And I told him, I asked him that question. He told me, the only thing I can tell you is, even if I know, I cannot tell you. But I really believe that they did. And then Anwar Sadat came. Anwar Sadat was somebody who was cultivating ties with the American long before. And the plan was, Kissinger culminated it, and then Carter. That's why I never forgive Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter's contribution to Israel and subjugation of the Arab is horrendous. He is one of the worst enemies of the Palestinian people. I don't care how many books write about apartheid. And then he clarifies it. I'm not talking about apartheid in Israel, but about the West Bank. I don't care about what he has to say about any subject, Jimmy Carter, even though he's going to be dying soon. But uh, I'm not relishing that. But I'm saying people will be remembering about his Camp David. His Camp David was awful because he ignored and neglected the Palestinian problem. And the plan was take Egypt out of the equation. If you take Egypt out, Israel will feel comfortable to focus on all other enemies. And that's what they did. They can take on Syria, they can take on Lebanon, they can take on the Palestinians. And the removal of Egypt was a great service that Jimmy Carter and Henry Kissinger did for the Zionist cause. Uh, but now we see, even when there's only Iran that's helping the Palestinian resistance, they are doing extremely well because the resistance movement of today is much more, effect well, so much more effective. Well, I want to I want to ask you to touch on that because I think it's really important that we recognize, I mean, what you just described, you laid out basically like, you know, almost a hundred years. Well, we're almost a hundred years since when you were talking about, but you laid out this history of Palestinian resistance and of failures at resistance. They resisted, but it was, but they failed. And I mean, that's what happens, right? You resist, you fail, you resist, you fail, but you look at what's Correct. happening today and you can see lessons from those failures have Excellent. influenced the behavior and strategic depth of organizations like Hamas, like Hezbollah, and other various factions who are involved as well. Can you talk a bit about the way we see these organizations that, the way the the, the, the successes of these organizations today um, versus what we used to see and what you think the evolution Excellent. of that was? Excellent. I mean, as I was very familiar with the experience of the Palestinian uh, resistance movement and the Lebanese movement and so on, what are the analogies between the two? One of the things that I've been thinking about lately is leadership, the personality of Nasrallah, the personality of Sinwar, not Khaled Mish'al. Khaled Mish'al reminds me of Yasser Arafat. Uh, and, Yasser, and Khaled Mish'al, for people who yeah. don't know, is really, out, is really out of the movement now. I mean, right. the internal Hamas in Gaza has now really broke, it took over Hamas. I mean, the exile Hamas are not running the movement anymore, really. And uh, what are differences? The leaders are fierce, fierce. Nasrallah, fierce individual. Sinwar is fierce. These are not people you can bend easily. PLO leaders were not fierce. Uh, I'm afraid, Rania, they were not fierce. Uh, Abu Iyad, the second in command of the PLO, in 1970, when he was arrested by the Jordanian, he collapsed. He started kissing the floor under the feet of King Hussein. These were not, uh, the eh, right, the movement today is not of that. You see the leaders of Hezbollah, there were two of them who were arrested by Israel. You see them in court, look up a picture of Dirani or uh, uh, Abdul Karim Abed, another cleric. I mean, they were fierce under conditions of torture. They tortured Mustafa Dirani. They were terrible with mistreatment and so on, but they do not are not breakable, one. Two, corruption. 
These are not people who have foreign bank account. I mean, this is why it's absurd when they say we froze the bank account of Sinwar. He has no money. They froze the bank account of uh, uh, Nasrallah. I mean, he has no bank account. Or we are now putting a ban on the travel to Europe and the United States. Yes, Nasrallah used to bring his kids yeah, to, Dis kid. to Disneyland. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> he, he used to bring his, his kids to Disneyland every year, and now he can't. And he's very upset about that. I mean, these are it shows you that the mind of these experts of the Middle East at the U.S. government. So, uh, so that's another thing. They are not corruptible. Do you know that one of the leaders of the PLO, Zuhair Mahsan, who led a small thuggish organization that was sponsored by the Syrian government called Saika Thunderbolt, he was assassinated in Cannes, France. What was he doing in Cannes? I mean, you know, on the southern Mediterranean shore of France, he was living there, spending months there. They killed him. So that's another thing. Uh, three, they are very good in intelligence and security. They know how to practice their ranks. In the PLO, Rania, anybody could join in. In the hundreds, in the thousands, they will bring you in, they give you a gun, and you are part of the movement, and you can rise up. Even if you're a thug like Muhammad Dahlan, like Jibril, Jibril Rajoub, even people with suspicious background, they will allow them in. So here today, they don't have that. They have screening and careful examination of the background of every person. And this is why intelligence on them is very, very weak. The fourth reason is they are serious about forging a resistance against Israel. I always give the existence of Hebrew. In the PLO days, I remember the PFLP, the Fatah, they did not have a Hebrew speaker. Every time they wanted to translate a document, they would go to the Institute of Palestine Studies and they would bring a teacher of Hebrew from there to translate a document. Hezbollah established a Hebrew school for their cadres. Their cadres in South Lebanon are fluent in Hebrew. They not only read documents, they intercept, intercept communication of Israelis. And that's how one time in 96 they had an ambush because they were intercepting their communications. Five, they are extremely mindful of the ways the enemy plays. They study the enemy carefully. I one time asked Nasrallah, what do you read? What do you read per day? He told me, you know, I, yes. When yes. did you meet Nasrallah? I met him a few times over the years. I did a few know. times. I'm sorry. Go back. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I didn't. Now you have to. Now you have to explain. And then you have right, to tell right. us exactly what was said. Well, I mean, as you know, I travel over the years to Lebanon, and I meet with all sorts of leaders, president, prime minister, and I ask him about, uh, you know, what's happening. And they, many of them are forthcoming to give me, uh, you know, their information to give me in, uh, to ask my, to answer my question about things. And he was one of the people who met me and was very open-minded to answer my question that I had for him wow. about the Present. movement and so on. <laughs> right. What year? So, I'm sorry, what year? What year was this? The last time I met him was 2006. I never met him since. Oh, yeah. wow. That is, yeah. that's okay. That's very interesting. So go ahead. Now you have to tell us the what you asked him and what he said. Right. So uh, I asked him, what, what do you read per day? And he told me, you know, I used to read religion because he said, as a religious person, I need to rise up in the religious hierarchy. And as a result, we have to do examination. And he said, I don't have time. He said, because all what I read is about Israel. He said, I spend oh. hours per day reading about Israel to understand Israel. In the PLO, Rania, there was no such effort. If you ask me, a man I idolized and uh, had a huge influence on me, George Habash, the leader of the PFLP, I cannot say that he really understood Israel or studied Israel in the same fashion. It wasn't like that. Yes, Arafat knew nothing about Israel. Yes, Arafat didn't understand America. I mean, just to give you an example, the advisor on Israeli affairs for Yasser Arafat was none other than Mahmoud Abbas of Ramallah. I mean, that tells you the story of how serious they were about understanding Israel. So uh, the leaders today, they really understand the enemy. They study the enemy very carefully. And that pays off because they can uh, expect their behavior. And they also establish their own internal communication network that the Israelis cannot intercept. They don't use wireless communication. I mean, they are smart in ways that the other movements were not smart at all. That's the difference. Another thing is they are, as I said, they are very, uh, when I say fierce, for example, George Habash, sometimes they would catch an Israeli spy and they would sign an order to execute him. But they never did. They were they were too, too nice. The family would come and say, please forgive that man. Please, he's stupid. He didn't know any better. And they would forgive. It was like that. It was not run. And George Habash, to his credit, last time I saw him in Damascus, he told me, he said, you know what? We tried 
and we failed. Now, there are new groups, Hamas and Hezbollah. They are trying new things, and I have to tell you, I'm impressed. It's different from what we tried. And that's why Israel is very upset. And that's why there's the whole campaign about Iran. That's why they campaign about Hezbollah. Because Israel is deterred. Israel is not used to being deterred. Imagine a group of Lebanese volunteers are deterring mighty Israel. Israel is scared of Hezbollah. How proud do I feel as a Lebanese? Tremendously. This is this is a uh, this is a country that used to make fun of the Lebanese army because it never resisted Israel. And they used to, except when Emil Lahoud was uh, the commander in chief, and except when he was president of Lebanon. That's the only brief experience. Other than that, look at the Lebanese army today, which is sponsored by the U.S., equipped by the U.S., and they give them helicopter uh, helicopters that are made of glass. Imagine you can you can throw a an apple on it and it will fall down. <laughs> uh, and that's why you know they shoot at the Lebanese army, and the Lebanese army is not shooting back at the Israelis. It's a very different experience in all counts. These people are serious. They genuinely believe they can liberate Palestine. And trust me, I believe them too. No, it's, it's, it's really incredible. The most powerful army in the region. And I would say the opposite of, is true of Israel. From everything you just said, where Palestinian Lebanese resistance, they've learned and grown and evolved from past failures, whereas the Israelis have become complacent, they've become sloppy, and they're increasingly, they increasingly do what, 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 what I guess Arab resistance used to do, which I've heard you talk about before, they increasingly act out of emotion um, rather than thinking strategically. And as a result, right. it's interesting, you just see this decline on the Israeli, despite having all the weapons they've access to the most high-tech weapons in the world, an endless supply from the Americans, diplomatic cover on and on and on they have access to everything and the arab side has has very limited access very they're limited. under sanction their weapons are, are they've gotten better weapons but they're not as good as hellfire missiles they don't have bunker buster bombs Absolutely. they don't have an Absolutely. air force anyways i'm sorry i don't know if you have anything to add no about no, no, that. No, no, no no i want to say something about that i do not overstate this argument i don't believe israel has become complacent or it used to be better no israel is israel Israel is as strong as it was before, but the resistance to Israel is on such a high level of performance and of effectiveness, of potency, and of daring, and of calculation. This is something that I've spoken about before. Arab governments and resistance were very impulsive, very impulsive. Sometimes Yasser Arafat would have a snag in his negotiation with the Americans, and he'd give an order, bomb northern Israel. You know, I mean, that's how they operated. And sometimes they would operate, may, uh, undertake an operation inside occupied Palestine because it was the anniversary of the movement. Hezbollah doesn't do it like that. It's not seasonal. They have a strategic plan and they are very careful. And this is why I am very happy that Hezbollah is resisting all these calls that they should open up a huge war. No, no, no. The enemies of Hezbollah do not decide when they should open up a big war. They know the situation. And they decide. Hamas knows the situation and they decide. I don't want columnists in Saudi newspaper telling them what to do. Because that's where Nasser fell, unfortunately. His enemies, the Saudi government, the Jordanian government, uh, the Ba'athist governments and so on. They all said, you should fight Israel. You should fight. And he was not ready. He absolutely was not ready. And he fell to impulse and he paid the price of his life. Yeah. But now we don't see that happening. And now what we see happening is, um, you know, there still can be a huge war. I think I think there is inevitably going to be a, a bigger war at some point in time. But like you said, it's on the terms of the resistance side, not on the terms of the Israelis, not necessarily at least. I mean, they're at the level of discipline is incredible. And you mentioned a lot of pressure from people who do want a front opened up uh, because they're angry. And right. That said, Hezbollah is able to enforce a level of discipline. No, we're going to be restrained right now. So it is incredible exactly. to watch. There's there's one last thing I want to touch on here. Given everything. Not restrained. Calcu not restrained calculatingly. Calculating. Calculating. I mean, they have lost 100 members, right? Yes. You know how many operations Hezbollah has undertook against Israel thus far? 507. They are not restrained. But they are doing it on their own terms. They are not dancing to the tunes of their enemy or of public emotions. Because some people who want Hezbollah to open a front are well-intentioned, but many others are badly-intentioned, like the Lebanese that you and I do not like. 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> the ones guys. who have no power and think they, yeah. <laughs> they say it matters in Twitter spaces. Um, right, right. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to, to kind of bring a lot of what you talked about with the earlier history to today. And that is the fact that we do see I mean, I think that we see there used to be different strands of Zionism. There was liberal Zionism. There was a sort of Jabotinsky style Zionism that you that you said was like the foundations of the Likud party. Revisionist um, Zionism. Revisionist Zionism. Uh, I think today you've seen a consolidation around Likud. It's like there's just one dominant form of Zionism now, and it's the nastiest. I mean, all Zionism is nasty in terms of the people who are impacted exactly. by it. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. But in thought. terms of the way the world sees it, in terms of the way the world sees it, and that was the usefulness of liberal Zionism, right? They had the kibbutzes, and it was like communal and leftist, and you know, it's just like a bunch of hippies, and like we're all gay and lesbian friendly, and you know, we're we're so Western, and we're just trying to civilize the place. Come visit, we'll smoke weed or something. But that's that's gone now. It's just Netanyahu <laughs> and worse. Um, talking about the kibbutz, first of all, I want to say that the kibbutz <laughs> adjacent to Gaza that got in the news on October 7th, the Nova kibbutz, Festival, the Nova Yeah, Music the kibbutz festival. was was taken from Palestinian land. These are this is Palestinian land. There was people living there, and they removed them from there. That's the history of kibbutz. Plus, for Arabs are concerned, and for the history of the conflict, strands of Zionism are irrelevant. They are all equally racist, equally genocidal. The only difference between them, some of the early Zionists, some of the early Zionists were Marxists, but they were as racist as the rest. It doesn't surprise me. And the notion of the kibbutz, the romanticization, it's all, it's all uh, you know, BS, really. I mean, I knew this American uh, Jewish person. She told me her experience. She was raised like a uh, Zionist and so on. So she went early in her life to a kibbutz, and she thought, everybody's living together. It's all communal. And she told me the reality is very different. In fact, the actress Sigourney Weaver, when she was at Stanford, she spent a year in Israel and she came back with the same experience, totally turned off by Zionism. She said the kibbutz is not what you hear. So the friend that who told me her experience, she said she goes to this kibbutz and she said everything communal. So she saw a, an orange. She started to eat an orange and then she hears somebody screaming, who ate my orange? Who is eating my orange? And she was like, I thought it's socialism here. <laughs> and they were like, absolutely not. It is not socialism. So the strands of Zionism, they disagree on issues that are unrelated to Palestinians, but they agree on this. They're all racist. They all believe that the right of the Zionist Jewish population supersede the rights of the original native. Uh, three, they believe that no methods of violence should ever be excluded in handling of the Palestinians. And four, that we will never allow the Palestinians to return back to their homeland. And five, that we will rely on the West, the racist colonial West, in order to perpetuate the subjugation of the Palestinian people indefinitely. On other issues, they disagree. They disagree about judicial reform. They disagree about the powers of the prime minister, about the Supreme Court role, but they don't disagree. Rania, as an Arab, as a human being, I will never forget, a mere 1% of Israelis wanted a ceasefire. 1%. And two-thirds of Israelis think the Israeli campaign in Gaza is not using enough force. Two thirds. Cool. And you want Arabs to make peace with them? Fat chance. If there was a chance, it will never exist again. There's no peaceful Zionism. There's no peaceful exactly. Zionism. You see it in the consolidation around the support for Gaza. Give me one Zionist organization anywhere that doesn't support genocide in Gaza. They won't call it a exactly. genocide. They it is gun Zionism. It's gun Zionism, as David Hurst called it. And by the way, I, I want to, can I recommend a few books for the audience? Please, please, yes. Because people are right. always asking what they should read. Please read David Hurst, uh, The Gun and the Olive Branch. Read the best book, in my opinion, my Bible on the Palestinian question. Walid Khalid's massive volume. Read it in stages, if you want, from Haven to Conquest. Read Rashid Khalid's recent book. Read Edward Said's book, The Question of Palestine. Read the book by Sami Hadawi, Bitter Harvest. Uh, read. Uh, there was another book. I was going to, uh, Maxime Rodinson, Israel and the Arabs, and read his second book, Is Israel a Settler, Col Settler Colonial State? Uh, there are so many good... Read an introductory book by Charles D. Smith, Palestine and the Arab-Israeli Question. It's a blow-by-blow -blow account. There are so many good books to read about the Palestinian problem. Read Helena Corban's book, uh, The PLO, among others.
Well, Asad, I want to thank you for joining me for the hour to break down what is such important history to understand thank why you. genocide in Gaza is happening. Can you remind people also where they can follow your work? Uh, they can follow my work on Twitter as my name, Asad Abukali. All right, Asad, thank you so much. This was Thank wonderful. you very much, Rani. Thank you very much.